Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here with Joe Sternberg and uh, Mary Anastasia O'Grady. Let's turn to China, which is struggling economically, expected to come out of its COVID lockdowns with a boom, and it's been anything but that. We now have flat growth in China and rising youth unemployment, 21.3% for young people ages 16 to 24 in June. That's a dangerous figure for Chinese Communist Party. And on top of this, we have President Biden's executive order banning certain U.S. investment in China. Most of it's targeted at high-tech areas, uh, artificial intelligence, semiconductors, a variety of applications, that uh, quantum computing that could affect the ability of the Chinese economy to advance in high-tech competitive areas and, of course, might have military implications. Uh, Let's listen to President Biden talk about that and then talk about how it fits into his economic strategy. We're continuing to make progress in fixing the supply chain. For example, we couldn't access semiconductors during the pandemic because the factories making them overseas were shut down. You all know semiconductors are those little small computer chips about the size of any of your fingertip that affect nearly everything in our lives. Folks, it's all part of my plan. The plan is to invest in America. We're transforming our country, including by rebuilding America's infrastructure. We used to have the best infrastructure in the world. We were number one in the world. That's ports, railroads, airports, roads, everything. You know, we are now. We're number 13 in the world. China used to be number eight. Now they're number two. How can you have the best economy in the world with a second-rate infrastructure? One uh, thing that I just have to say about the president is uh, I wonder why he always sounds so angry about things. I mean, he sounds angry when he's telling you what he had for breakfast. It's just a tonal issue, which is kind of off-putting to me as he shouts about semiconductors and what he says is a winning economic strategy. But let's start first with the Chinese economy. How much trouble is it in? It's in a lot of trouble. I think the the backstory here is that for um, a couple decades, really, China's economic growth was powered by credit, a huge expansion in bank lending and other forms of gray market, quasi-official credit that would float around in the ecosystem of China's economy. And a lot of that found its way into real estate to the point where in recent years, real estate accounted for about a third of China's GDP every year by some count. So, I mean, this is a huge unbalanced economy that was based on an asset price bubble. And a few years ago, Beijing realized that something had to change about that. that This was not sustainable. So the Chinese authorities had been gradually trying to deflate that real estate bubble. It seems to be working. The problem is they haven't worked out what the alternative is going to be. And I think that that alternative should involve a lot of private entrepreneurship, enterprise, really leaning into the market reform process that China had started in the 80s. For political reasons, the Communist Party has been very resistant to that and has been trying to increase state control of the economy. And that is the core of the problem that they have now. They've realized that they can't do the debt-fueled, real estate-driven economic growth that they had before, but they haven't made their peace with what a successful alternative economy would look like instead. The uh, point you're making, I think, is that some of these economic wounds in China are self-inflicted, that they have made themselves more suspect as a locale for investment, both domestic and foreign. And we're seeing some of that reluctance on foreign investment in uh, American firms and other firms hedging their bets on uh, supply chains and being more cautious about investment in, in China. And now, Mary, we have this executive order from President Biden. The Chinese were very worried about this. This has been mooted for some time, this executive order. And the Chinese weighed in very heavily, my reporting suggests, with Janet Yellen on her trip there saying, we don't like this at all. Now they've issued it nonetheless, although it's narrow. It's really aimed at really high tech sectors. This isn't any kind of broad decoupling of the two economies. What do you make of the Biden decision here? 
Well, I think uh, President Biden is concerned about technology that uh, will then be taken by the Chinese and used in the military sphere. And, uh, you know, its threats against Taiwan, uh, the way it's behaved with Hong Kong. You know, there's reason to worry about Chinese aggression on the military front. But I find it a little bit inaccurate to think that this is a problem that's coming from Joe Biden. I mean, the Chinese have made investing in China more risky because they have tried to centralize power, tried to move in a hostile manner against private investors. And so I think, in a sense, President Biden is telling investors, you know, don't go to China with this technology. But investors are almost ahead of him pulling in their horns in terms of the risks that they're willing to take in China because of the, the signals that President Xi has been sending for quite some time. Joe, this is uh, going to get uh, this executive order because of its narrow ambit is going to get some criticism, I think, from uh, Republicans in particular here in the United States who say it doesn't go far enough. We have a uh, there's a variety of views, of course, about how much decoupling we should do between the two economies. On the one hand, you have somebody like a Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, who would like to do a very broad and maybe even in total decoupling. You have Mike Gallagher, the chairman of the House Special China Committee, who would be somewhere in between where Rubio is and where Biden is. But you have an awful lot of Republicans and the many Democrats who also say that we have to do a lot more to protect ourselves from Chinese cyber theft, Chinese intellectual property theft, and that American firms who have built supply chains in China need to diversify more aggressively because of what could potentially happen to those firms and to the U.S. supply chain for goods like drugs and other things. If there's a breakdown because of an invasion of Taiwan or some security showdown. I think the key way to think about whether this executive order goes far enough or, or too far or whatever debate you want to have about it is to understand that there are a couple different issues going on here. I mean, one basic factor on the national security front is that we all need to understand that any investment restriction that Washington wants to impose on money flowing into China is not going to be a substitute for the investment that we in America need to make in our own military. If the thing that you are concerned about is Chinese aggression potentially against Taiwan or aggression in its neighborhood in general, the investment restrictions is only going to be a very small part of that. And then the other factor here in terms of the business angle Look, a lot of companies understand the risks of doing business in China. That's been a big part of the China story over the past few years, even going back to before the pandemic, was this growing understanding that there are problems with intellectual property theft in China, that the policy environment is arbitrary and capricious, that the Communist Party is going to insist on entrenching political control of the economy, that this is all going to be bad for foreign investors. So companies get that and increasingly have been acting on that insight, independent of whatever governments are telling them to do. One thing that we could be doing is focusing on making sure that the U.S. is the most attractive place possible for some of that investment to come back to. Or we can also be focusing on building trading alliances with other allies in the region that could be alternative destinations for that American investment if it isn't going to be coming back to the U.S. Well, I think you just hit uh, Mario Grady's hotspot here when you said trade, because we know that Donald Trump dropped out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership when uh, he became president. That had been all but signed, sealed, and delivered. And that did not include China, but it did include a U.S. trade deal with Japan, long, attractive trade deal with Japan. We haven't had that. And Chile and uh, Vietnam and several other Pacific Rim nations, Joe Biden said that he wanted to improve trade policy from Donald Trump, but he's kept it pretty much in place, Mary. And that trade is, as a growth strategy for us has really not been helpful here for the last couple of years. Yeah, I think Joe's comment reminds me of the uh, sports analogy that the best defense is a good offense. So if we want to defend against China aggression, expansion, and that sort of thing, I think U.S. economic strength is key. And trade is a central part of that. It's really sad to see that both parties have 
kind of abandon that that mission, which is so important to the U.S. economy. And you can argue the trade with China, maybe we had to reduce that and our vulnerability to China, but that doesn't mean we have to for all kinds of other nations as well. All right. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all for listening here on Potomac Watch. We're here every day on our podcast talking about the world, politics, economics, foreign policy, you name it. Hope to have you here tomorrow and every day on Potomac Watch. Mm -hmm.